hypothetical situation, totally hypothetical. You come to my house every single morning for breakfast. That's an arrangement between us for the last 20 years. And then afterwards, you sit and there. Okay, and one day, you come into my house completely stoned down, trust each other, and you vomit all over the floor and all over the carpets and into my children pot and everything else. And I think to myself, this is not, like, not a nice way to behave. She said, forgive me. So I said, okay, fine, I forgive you, right? But I'll never let you into my house ever again. Now, in the union of non-verbal communication, if every time you knock on the door, I don't open the door, but if I open the door and see you, I slam the door in your face, that means I didn't forgive you. And you know that I didn't forgive you. I didn't say to you, I didn't say because of your disgusting behavior, but it's obvious I have not forgiven you. So if you say that, you know, I ask a shame, she says, yeah, I forgive you, but don't you dare come near me. Don't come, don't come into 770 ever again. Whoever sees you is going to pick up a brick and throw it in your head. That's not forgiveness. No, obviously the parable is, is inaccurate. <laughs> the correct parable, the way to see it, is that um, what you did was you didn't vomit on the floor. You vomited on your clothing. Okay. And you ruined your clothing. Okay. So the question now becomes, am I going to buy you a new suit? Okay. I, as the house owner, am I going to buy you a new suit? Or is it up to you? To get to go either clean your clothing or if, if and if it can't be cleaned to, to buy a new one. Why should you buy me a new suit? You shouldn't. That's what I'm saying. No, I mean if I have only got my clothing, why should the shame buy me a new suit? You shouldn't. Suit? That's exactly but the why, point. Why, but, but that doesn't come to you forgiveness. Yeah. To go buy. <laughs> That's what new people suit. want, though. <laughs> buy, buy they want a, both that I should vomit on myself, yeah. and when the shame forgives me, my whole my whole suit should now be cleaned like it came from 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 the store. Cleaning the suit is, is a part of doing tshuva. No. It's repairing Exactly. Itself, right? Exactly. And nobody ever expected when Hashem forgives you that he's then going to give you... But you see that there's two parts here. One is to get the 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 person whose house, whose house I vomited in. Yeah. Get into, I don't know why did you bring that example. <laughs> to, but it turned out okay. No, to to forgive me for what I did in his house. Okay. No. It's settled. Okay. So, uh, the idea is the, the palace is another makif. What you what you blemish are the makifim. What you blemish are the are the garments, okay? and that blemish you have to fix. And that you you can't you can't go into the same place again. Now, by the way, as far as the palace is concerned, it's not the owner of the house, because you're not talking about some simple person who goes and an answers the door for himself. There are guards. The guards won't let you in. There, it's the same idea as with the clothing. So now you have to make to good say, with them. You have to do tshuva, and you also have to metaken something. Right. Which is more than just right. simple tshuva. Right, right. It means that there's a pagam. It means that it, there's also another thing uh, that the Tzemech Tzedek brings. That so during a, the... That would be the equivalent of the fasting. The 70 yeah, fasting. Could be, could be. The yeah. Tzemech Tzedek brings another thing. He says... Um, after you do an Avera and you've blemished your clothing or your lavouche, yeah. so the time that it takes you to clean it, I mean, it's not like that you you fixed it in a split second. It didn't fix like that. So the time, you, you didn't learn. Okay? You didn't learn that morning in your example. How do you make that up? Why didn't you learn that morning? Because, because you had to go home to clean yourself. You couldn't sit the way you were and continue to learn with me every morning, okay, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you also lost that. So it brings many, many things that you lose. It's not, it's not just a bump in the road. It's a bump in the road that has a lot of consequences for the engine. And you have to go fix that, and, you, and, and it takes time. It's not something that just happens uh, in a moment. The, 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 again, as far as Hashem is concerned, He's very happy to see you. <laughs> But you can't get into the place the way you were. It, it doesn't work the same way anymore. Okay. Okay. Something like that. That would be an even, an even stronger parable. Okay. So let's continue here. No, no, the muscle was okay, but you just have to. Uh, okay. Okay. So anyway, we're now explaining the first type of chuba, which he said is to remove the blemishes. Okay. That's exactly what we're talking about. 
So what are these blemishes? What are these... Um, know, does the word blemish even mean anything to somebody who speaks modern English? I don't know. How would you say uh, ketim? Stain. Yeah, so it's, it's removed the stains. <clears throat> I don't know why they say blemishes. The stains. So where are the stains? The stains are on, your, are, are on you. Well, not exactly on you, because again, Hashem wants to see you. He, he, he accepts you the same way the moment that you've done tshuva. The and you've said you regret. The difference between a stain on you and being a stain on your garments, because you can take the garments off and change them. Can. Anything that can, can be stained, can, but then you can't. Then who said you can stain it? Then the right word wouldn't be a stain. A stain is like something on the, on the exterior, right? So he says now, what what does the stain do? What what is what happens? What is the result of having an avera? I mean, what's the tshuva for? What am I doing actually? So he explains. So that's what we started yesterday. What does it mean? That avonatechem avdilim beniu venechem. That your sins are what uh, divides the wrong word, but they separate between you and me. How can you be? You just said how can you be separated from Hashem? Hashem, Hashem won't close the door on you. So what do you mean separated? It says the problem with separation is not that Hashem doesn't want you anymore, but always the problem is now with you that you're insensitive to Hashem. That's another thing that you have to fix. For instance, how come, how could you have come to see the king stone drunk, like you said? Where did that come from? Okay, if, you, if this would happen um, in a work setting, so let's say the first time nothing would happen, second time nothing would happen, you go back to business. The third time you say, Mister, you've got a drinking problem. Or you've got a problem with my authority. If you, you got something else, you have to go take care of it. So even though I very much want you to work here, and I very much want you to be part of everything, but you've got to fix this, uh, this problem you've got inside of you, because clearly your behavior is showing that you have an issue. And so even though Hashem, we, Hashem forgives you completely, but it means that you have an issue with Hashem that you're not aware of. Right? It's like the guy who says, uh, walks into the psych, uh, psychologist's office and he says, I'll speak about everything except for my father. I don't want to speak about my father. So psychologist, unless he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's, he's, he's not listening, he right away knows that the biggest problem is with his father. What do you mean? What do you mean? You don't want to listen to your You don't want to talk about your father. That's where the biggest problem is. So the same way here, the thing that goes un, 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 unmentioned, but you see the behavior, right away you see that, that that's where the problem is. So here he says, so even though Hashem wants you very much after you do the tshuva, He wants you the same way, but you have an issue. You're stained. And what's the stain? The stain is what's called Elokai Bekirbi, is the life force, the godliness within me. So now he's going to explain, that's what we started yesterday, what this idea of symptom of, of, of God's life force being inside the person, what does that mean? Because again, what most people understand is, I can move my hand. That's godliness. Okay. There you have it. I don't need anything more. So he says, okay, that's very nice, but, but you're an intelligent being. Okay. So when we say um, life force is inside of you, we don't just mean that you can move your hand. You're supposed to move it with some kind of reason, with some kind of purpose. Okay. So, so it's not just that you can move. You're, even an animal has some kind of purpose. So the question is whether godliness is providing the purpose for what you're doing. That would mean that godliness is within you, is animating you. Okay. So let's see how this works out. We saw yesterday. Even though Hashem is everywhere, He's not revealed everywhere. We said in nature He's not revealed. You can go look as much as you want. You'll never find God. What will you find? You'll find things that to a religious person, <clears throat> they insinuate that God is here. But it's not proof for anybody. <clears throat> Nobody who, who, is, uh, who is not religious, who doesn't believe, will be forced to admit, ah, this says that God is... No, said, <laughs> you can explain it according to nature. And that's exactly what Eluki means. What a lewd and what Uh, 
כמו על דרך משל באדם. So, sorry, so, so we ended with הלם וגילוי. So we said that at the level of אצילוס, at the higher level, again, it's very important here, the אצילוס is this way, the world of emanation is this way, there there is a revelation of godliness. It's revelation and concealment. And it's not, somebody asked here on the, on the, on the class, um, in the questions, the comments, how do we translate histalkut vit pashtut? So I'll say it again, that, that there are, this is what we learned mostly last year, that the two major um, ways in which we relate to godliness is either concealment and revelation, which is the higher way of relating, meaning that a person knows that everything is godliness, it's just, it's not revealed all the time. And when it's reveal, revelation and concealment, there's no change in the world. Everything that we call change is not change anymore. It's just seeing different aspects of godliness at different, uh, at different instances. It's not even different instances anymore. It just becomes a, a train without even time involved. Like in the way that um, when you see a picture, so you see everything, at, at, in the beginning you see everything at the same time. But you can't really focus on everything. It's too big. You're in the, the field of uh, the field of vision is not wide enough to to focus on everything at the same time. So then it breaks down and becomes like over time you see each each separate part. But there's no change. The picture is still always the same. It's just that God is very very big. So every time that we look, we're seeing a different aspect. That's how you live in in the consciousness of the world of emanation. And um, anybody who is an artist. I think would have a lot more to say about this. Like, what, how do they, how they draw? Like I'm talking about a, how they see a, a, a painter. So somebody who paints would probably have a lot more insight into what this process is like in the mind. The other aspect is what we call etzem um, vit pashtut, or here we call the distalkut vit pashtut, which is, which is, which uh, suggest change and says that there are changes because it's not just that God is being revealed or concealed it's rather that sometimes he extends and sometimes he retracts okay. sometimes he's in something sometimes he's not that, that again that's an experience that we have it's not that this is how God is it's relevant, relative to you okay. our, our subjective uh, relationship with God is such that we sometimes feel that God has extended into something. I think that we live in a, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in a building site, right? With the amount of noise in, on the street, it's like unreal. Yesterday I had a couple over in the morning. For two hours we couldn't hear anything. Just gonna, I closed all the windows, still couldn't hear. So either so, so there, there, here you would have something like this. And now God, the moment that I stop talking, it's not just he's, he's concealed. Uh, our, whole, our whole focus is now on the noise in the background. So God is retracted. It's like he's not, he's not, it's not just he's being covered up. He's not in my consciousness at all. So it's like it's outside of me. And there we feel that there's changes in the world, right? So, so in the psyche you have these two ways of relating to God. He's either extending or, or, or retracting, or concealment and revelation. And again, the big difference is that in concealment and revelation there's no change. And that he's constantly omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Equally, it's just a question of whether he's being revealed or not. But in extension and in retraction there is like a change in the godliness. That there's more or less in something, or in, an, or in a certain moment. How do we understand this? What's the example from physiology? It's a famous example that we've seen many, many times. So my thought, which, which makes my, my leg move, okay, is constantly within my entire body 
except that in the foot, in my leg, it's concealed. It's not revealed, because you can't think inside your leg. That doesn't work. I, but what do you see? But you see that there's extension. That in the moment in which I want to move my leg, then it's as if my mind, it's not that it appears there. It's like it extends. It takes a time. It's very little time. But there's time involved. I said, how did they know this? And uh, like, how do they know it still takes time? Usually, again, they bring the, the ex example that if I now extend my leg, it's even called extension and retraction, I think, in, in terms of the muscles. There's extension and pro... What do they call the other one? I don't remember. Retraction. No, no, no. my wife knows. She's a, yeah, some kind of contraction of the muscle. Okay, maybe, it's, maybe the right way to say it is extension and contraction. In any case, so you have these two aspects happening in the person himself. So for godliness to appear in an open manner, meaning to be revealed, the only way to attain this is by having some kind of mechanism of contraction. And so what would happen? So now you would say that when I move my foot, it's as if my mind extended and it contracts, it extends and contracts. And then you say, thanks to that, now I know that my thought was there all the time because it's like instantaneous. But I have this, I, I have to have some kind of mechanism of change in order to appreciate the fact that godliness is everywhere all the time. Because otherwise I wouldn't understand. It's like saying, I couldn't appreciate the idea that godliness is everywhere if I didn't have an experience of change over time. And then when I think about it, I say, but God is instantaneous, so what, why? The, so the change is just for me, it's just for my benefit. Okay? Another way of saying it is, and again, there it's a little bit different, but it's the same idea, is that when I learned Torah, so the godliness and the words that I learned was always there. But as far as my mind is concerned, it expanded or contracted, depending on if I have to go you know, back and forth in some kind of explanation. From that expansion and contraction, I come to appreciate the fact that the Torah was always godly. So you need to have the, both of them. Now the expansion and contraction, that's the name Elohim. That's the, that's the name that we call nature. So there has to be something like this, that I feel that the expansions and the contractions are godly. In other words, because it's, it's, it's for Hashem, it's to come very low to, to be in a world of change. Can, but he's constant. So he has to he has to do something which we call symptom contraction, it's called contraction, in order to even appear as something that changes. But for there to be a reality that changes that I could then fathom, that I could then comprehend, without change I couldn't comprehend anything. We talked about this in terms of the sight and all, all the examples that we gave. Without there being godliness that appears in the sense of contraction and extension or change our, the human mind couldn't begin to understand the godliness and that's what this, the, you know, the famous medrash about Avram Avinu not a car, it's a truck. Anyway, um, the famous medrash about Avram Avinu, that it begins with him seeing change, right? First he sees the sun, and he says, 
but then it's exchanged. Right? The sun extends, but then it contracts, it retracts, it, and, the, and the moon comes, and then the sun comes again. So he begins to understand the changes are just a facade. They're just the external aspect that allows him to begin to ask the questions. What is going on here? Once he understands that the change is just, it's called those names, like handles to ha hold on to, then he can come to the conclusion that what's behind it all is a permanent state, an omnipresence, omniscience, all these things that suggest that there's no change. And that's what's really hiding behind it. Um, and that's, that's the, right, it's very interesting that in Greek thought, it was exactly the same process. Because in the beginning, you got Heraclitus, one of the pre-Socratics, and most of them, most of them have the same deal going on. He's just the most, uh, he's the most extreme. You can't step into the same river twice. I think we talked about this once. It also, it starts from change. Everything is so, so much in change, so much in flux, you can't hold on to anything. But then the Socratics come, and, and the big change was that they began to talk about what, so what is permanent? This is ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. Anyway, okay, so that's, that's the, um, and again, this is a topic that repeats so many times. This was one of the big, big uh, breakthroughs, one might say, of, of, of the Alter Rebbe, being able, being able to explain these two, these two aspects, the one changing, the one not changing, and showing that one is dependent on the other. You can't come to understand godliness until you have an appreciation for change. And in fact, that's probably what the Rambam means when he says you need to look at nature in order to begin to understand godliness, right? That's how he starts Hilchot Deot. That's how he, uh, sorry, that's how he starts uh, Sefer Ramada, knowledge of God. Knowledge of God begins by looking at nature. Why? Because nature is changing. Nature is in constant flux. And you need to be able to appreciate that as the extension and contraction of godliness in order to see what's beyond it, what doesn't change. So by Rambam, the things that don't change are called schalim nivdalim. They're called abstract thought. Abstract th thought is not dependent on, you know, on, on changing circumstances. It's supposed to be absolutely true. So that one plus one equals two always. It doesn't matter if you bring me pens or you bring me books. You bring me whatever you want. You change it up, mix it up, do whatever you want. In the end, the abstract thought, one plus one equals two, is constant. It doesn't change. And that's that's how the Rambam. That's his whole picture of, of reality, right? Okay. But by the Rambam, the only thing that was unchanging was the truth of absolute thought. For him, godliness was thought. It was the thought that was beyond the changing thought, meaning the abstract mind, the schalim nivdalim, that for him is the godliness itself. It means that he doesn't recognize the thought as being another thing that changes. Today in modern thought, we would say thought also changes. One plus one equals two, that's true, but even that changes. <laughs> and we have new insight into this. Uh, in group theory, in all kinds of ways, that one plus one equals zero. Is that a... What? Right, you didn't know that. Okay. After Lavin, so now it goes into a question. This is a very important question, it's a side question. I'll just sum it up. In, in a moment, it's important to read it. He says, if this is true, what does it mean that every soul is a part of God above? That every soul 
is a certain part of the godliness. Of the, and here we're using the name, the four-letter name, which means that we're talking about the unchanging. How can you say that? If you're saying a part, right? And the Tanya explained this in different ways. But here he goes into much deeper explanation than he did in the Tanya. Okay. So to understand this, he says, really, when we say part, what we mean is a part of Havaya, we mean in terms of the vessels. The vessels are a certain part of godliness. In other words, that one person understands math, let's say, meaning he'll understand the, the, the um, constant nature of godliness, the, the uh, omnipresent, the unchanging aspect of godliness through mathematics. There's another person that will understand it through poetry. There's another person that will understand it through some other, uh, again, something that they have a vessel for. So they have a vessel for means that they have some attachment to, that they're able to comprehend. That changes. Or in the Torah we'd say that one person finds himself, and here we're really dealing with the name of Avaya. Until now we just said different vessels. But what does it mean that my vessels are from different parts of Avaya. So one person connects to Hasidus, meaning he's, he's connecting to the concealed tradition of Torah. There's another person who connects through Halacha. There's a third person who connects through Remez, the illusions, which is, you could say it's poetic, you could say it's numerical, all, all, kinds, of, all kinds of different uh, ways of explaining it. And yet a fourth person connects through the stories. Shot. There are four, each person has different vessels, how we connect to the constant nature of godliness. And you can have more than one, you can have it, and it can be a, a mix. That's why the Rebbe said, uh, and it's exactly what we're learning here, or what we learned actually last week, that a person who's not mechadish in the Torah, a person who doesn't whose learning doesn't cause him to say something new, it means that he's working on, uh, on half speed. He's, he's not working. Because if you have those vessels, the nature of a vessel, especially these vessels that they come from the world of emanation, the, their nature is to always uh, innovate, to do something new. So if you're learning Torah and nothing new comes out, it hasn't percolated through you. You're not a wellspring like we talked about last week. So this is very important. It's a technical thing, but the bottom line is that every single person has the constant nature of godliness within them. The soul root of all the souls, the light of the souls, the soul itself, is all from the world of emanation. So every single soul understands what the constant nature of godliness is. Every single soul sees beyond the changing reality. Every single soul that's what, is like Avram. That when you get beyond, you can get beyond that which is changing, and you can see that which is permanent, and so you have a direct connection with godliness itself. Every single soul. In terms of the vessels, we're different. Some souls come to it through understanding change, like we said, in this or that area, or in this or that area of, of Torah. So that's, that's a, it's a very important uh, note, but it's, it's just a note here. Okay, so we're going to skip it, and we're going to come straight to chapter 2. It's filling up gas or something. So chapter 2. Almost today's Tanya. We're in, we're in chapter 4. So in, in chapter 5, he wants to, he wants to in, in, the, in, the, in the epistle of Tshuva, in the Tanya, he 
wants to explain what it means that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And it says in the Tanya, we said, it says it in the, first, in the second chapter already, that what it means is that when you breathe into something, it's different than speaking. When you're speaking, it's external, it's relatively... And, and, but breathing is from the essence, from the substance of the person. And again, the famous example, that if you speak, you can speak from now until the end of time. But if you fill up balloons, you have to take a break at some point. Because breathing expands your essence. So what does it mean that your sins are, are, are causing a separation? She says, as far as externally speaking, okay, you did tshuva, so fine. But that's not the separation that was caused. The separation was caused internally. Okay, in, in the internal light. Why? Because when you breathe, so here he's taking it in a different direction. He's saying if you breathe and there's something obstructing your, your breath, so you can't breathe as well. And, you, and your breath doesn't reach the place that's obstructed. Now he's coming even closer because he has another one to fill. So now he's right behind us. <laughs> okay. So now he says, so this is a this is a parable for understanding what a sin does. It obstructs the inner light from, from appearing. Now before we said that the blemish is external. Now he's saying that the inner light doesn't enter. Right? All the time. Because again, I'm living, I'm living the changing aspect of godliness. I either feel that godliness is within me or not within me. It's extended into me or not. It's seldom that I feel and two times a day I should feel the sense of the world of emanation that all is godliness and there's no changing. But my day-to-day -day life is Ratzov showed. My day-to-day -day life is the godliness is extending and, and retracting, extending and retracting. That's how I live my day-to-day -day life. So my day-to-day -day life is like there's a breath of godliness coming into me. But my sins, they cause a separation and, and it can't come in. So, how do you live? You live without it. Uh, because it's always there. It's just, again, my experience is one where there's no extension. So when, when he gives this example of, of breath, obviously he's not talking about the permanent aspect of godliness within you. In that sense, no sin can ever touch that. There's nothing that can touch that. No matter what you do, and that was basically the takeaway from the previous section that we skipped. No matter what you do, you, there's always an aspect of you that's 100% connected to God. There's always, there's always that. However, your consciousness is not like that. So when we, what we mean about Pnimi here is our perception, our, how it's integrated into us. Meaning that I may know that above my perception, I'm always connected to God. I may know that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an intellectual piece of knowledge, but I don't experience that. I don't perceive it to be that way. And that's exactly what we mean, that it's, it's relatively external. It's, rel it's relatively an external blemish. In other words, God wants me just as much after I vomited on the carpet and on myself. There's no difference. Nothing changed. But my perception is not that way. I have a problem now. I have a problem with my clothing. I have a problem with, with what I did. And the problem would be more 
that it's not that. Now, going back to your parable from the beginning of the, when we started learning today, it's not that God doesn't want to see me. I'm ashamed to show myself. And that's where the problem really begins. So the, the stain, the blemish on my garments is how I perceive the situation. I'm not, I don't feel comfortable coming again after I did what I did. Now, there, there, there are people who have a, a psychological problem with this. I'm one of those people, so I know. There are people who look at the external side of reality where we have to be nice to each other. We have to act cordially. We have to, there are certain codes of how to, how to and they ignore it. And they say, what does it matter? In the end, we're connected anyway. It doesn't matter. And so, if I vomit on your carpet, it shouldn't matter to you. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> so that just means that uh, you're unaware of the changing reality. It doesn't mean you're a tzaddik. You're just a... Uh, there are, some, there are some people who are tzaddik. Who said that is the way you're supposed to play? What? Who said that that is the way you're supposed to play? How? That you shouldn't even care. You shouldn't care. If somebody does something to you, not if you do something to somebody else. If somebody does something to you, you should take it that in the end we're connected. That's how you should treat your wife. And even if uh, harsh words were said, whatever, it doesn't matter. You put it aside because our connection is much deeper than that. If she hurt me. But I can't treat her the, the, the same way. I can't say to, come to her and say, look, you know that we're connected anyway. So what if I said you're a pig? <laughs> I can't demand that from someone else. It doesn't make any sense. So the people who, who one would say are, don't think that uh, relationships, relationships and all that accompany them apply to them. They need to be very careful because they'll expect the same from others and that's not, not usually the case. You have to know that Shalish Shilcha Shilcha Shilcha. However I see the world, that's my problem. How you see the world, can, but however I see, I have to accommodate you. And however you see, it's fine by me. I'll accommodate. I'm a, I will accommodate myself. That's, that's what the true Hasid does. That if you hurt me, that's external. I forgive you right away. Why? Because, again, because I understand, was upset. Yeah, because I understand this is all the external changing aspect of godliness. I'm not so upset by it. But if I hurt you, I have to take into consideration that you don't see the world of emanation yet. You don't yet see that everything is one. And so I did something wrong. From that perspective, I did something wrong. Right? So that, that's a, a very important point. So he's saying, so the thing that separates, that makes godliness not apparent in the changing, extending and contracting reality is a sin. That's what a sin does. A sin makes it impossible for the extension to occur, for the contraction to occur normally. The changes stop. And all you feel is a constant state of being rejected. But again, it's from your perspective. That's all it is. It's not really that this is really the case. Because you're always connected in the world of emanation. If your consciousness was there, was there you'd be fine. And yet, it's not enough. Because the sins are in the worlds of creation, formation, and action. You're right. In emanation, there's no sins. <laughs> there's no such thing. Doesn't exist. What do you have in emanation? A different revelation. Even the sin is a revelation of God. But you can't live that way. In the same way that you can't tell somebody else, ah, the fact that I vomited on your on your rug, you should just forgive me, because you and I are one thing. It doesn't work that way. Now 
always here. He just keeps coming closer. He's filling gas. What time is it? I'm getting tired of yelling. 835, and I'm going to the okay. We have to discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow is the day after today. Tonight I'm going to the back and going to this famous wedding. Which I have to go to and we'll do it as well as